welcome to the Catholic Economics Podcast. I'm your host, Levi Russell, and today is September 13th, 2020. So today I have a very special guest. I'm very excited. I'm very starstruck. We have, uh, we have uh, William M. Briggs of WMBriggs.com, uh, the statistician to the stars. I'm sure a lot of my audience reads his website. But I'm just going to quickly read part of his resume here uh, that he has on his website. Uh, I am a wholly independent vagabond writer, statistician, scientist, and consultant. Previously a professor at the Cornell Medical School, a statistician at DoubleClick in its infancy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and a sort of cryptologist with the U.S. Air Force. My PhD is in mathematical statistics, though I am now a data philosopher. And then he says he made that up. An epistemologist, probability puzzler, unmasker of over, over certainty, and self-awarded bioethicist. My MS is in atmospheric physics and bachelor's is in meteorology and math. I, I wanted to have you on because I, I think there, there's, for anyone who reads your, your blog consistently, and I've been reading mostly your, your, uh, your stuff on the affliction lately. And I think it's really interesting because you, you have a perspective and, and you have an outlet here with your blog that just kind of lets you say whatever you, whatever you feel like saying about the data. And so I wanted to see if, if, if you would just kind of go through your thoughts, maybe starting at the beginning and then uh, kind of leading up to the point we're at now, as far as the policy. So like, you know, beginning, the beginning of this thing was what, February, March. Uh, did you, did you see anything at the beginning that told you, um, that helped you predict whether this was going to be like an actual big event that was going to kill millions of people sure. or what did, what did you, what did you see up front that gave you an inkling about this? I saw, I saw people on our side of the fence, uh, mm -hmm. generally speaking, the more conservative side of the fence sort of freaking out over news in China. I happened to be in Asia at the time, uh, back mm -hmm. in December, January in Vietnam and in Thailand, and people were starting to get nervous about all this news coming out of China. And people saying, oh my God, we have exponential growth, exponential growth, exponential growth of all these uh, reports coming out of uh, deaths from what you're calling the affliction, which I call Corona doom. Right. <laughs> and I thought, this is nuts. They're making, they're making predictions based on uh, increases in, in body counts that were exponential. Now, that's a very special mathematical thing to be exponential. If right. you, it's, it, it's like the old doubling rule, right? You start with a, a, a penny today, tomorrow you double it, you got two cents, you double that, you got four and then eight cents. It doesn't sound like much, but right. at the end of a month, you know, you own uh, more wealth than there is in the entire world. Right. And so people were saying this kind of thing about the, wow. about the, uh, the affliction or Corona doom. I thought that's nuts. I said, this thing looks like it's going to be just a regular pandemic of which we have every 10 to 20 years. We've had mm -hmm. consistently throughout human history. It's yep. in no way unusual uh, or unexpected or, or strange in any way. And so why were people getting nervous about this? So I started doing forecasts. Mm -hmm initially doing forecasts of China saying, you know, people, epidemiologists, we don't fit these kinds of exponential models. We have very standard uh, epidemic curves that uh, right. seem to work ra rather well. It's rather dull. It's not interesting. And I just did it as a kind of a, a lark on the side for uh, people who follow me and want to do, want to learn statistics. So I provided the code updates, all those kind of stuff. And then, yeah. and then uh, people started taking it more and more seriously, which surprised me. I couldn't understand what was going on. And, and for some reason, I don't know, the, the images out of China panicked people. Right. Uh, people don't understand. I, I, I love the Chinese people, but they're, they're, they're sort of uh, hypochondriacs by nature. <laughs> and they tend to overreact on any kind of health things. But, just as soon as they, they do, they, 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 they cancel themselves on this. I mean, China's already sort of back to normal. The rest of the world has, is still losing its mind over this thing. And people talking about it being unprecedented, unusual, never before seen. Right. People then started coming out with models, uh, the, the English model from the Imperial College run by a guy named Neil Ferguson said there's going to be over two million, two and a half million dead in the United States if we don't do anything. What the heck is he talking about? Yeah, I, yeah, I, want, to, I want to mention him real quick. So I, there at the beginning, you were talking about exponential and it seems like, seems like, you know, 
you know, part of, part of that uh, epidemiology type perspective, you know, there is an exponential part to that curve, but it, it seems like the issue is just extrapolation. Like you were saying with the penny thing, it's, it's, yeah, you, you know, okay, you eventually have more money than everything, you know, than, and, than, than exists on the planet, but obviously that's impossible. And so you, you were saying, it seems like everyone has forgotten about this sort of standard uh, curve. And then, and then you start talking about Neil Ferguson. And, and to me, you know, this guy was interesting to me at the beginning as well, because, you know, being in, in agriculture, uh, as I am, I've, I've been an, an ag econ professor uh -huh. and, you know, I've, I've, you know, I remember the swine flu and the bird flu and, um, you know, these are all uh, serious issues for agriculture, you know, because they, 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 they also persist in these animal populations. We have a lot of experience with them in the animal populations and they, you know, affect food prices sometimes and stuff like that. But it seemed like this Neil Ferguson guy, it's like, he's, he's one of these people where he's, he's predicted, um, you know, 10 of the last one, you know, massive, you know, death event uh, over the last 20 years or so. It's like he, he just, every, every other year, he just says these things are going to be like life alteringly horrific. You know, they're going to change the rotation of the planet or some nonsense like this. And then, you know, nothing happens or so we hear from the media. Right. So I, it seemed like the whole thing was just a smoke screen. It just got kind of turned around. It's like, okay, well now we're just gonna, now we're just going to take whatever this guy says is gospel, even though he's been wrong you know, every other year for the last 20 years. It's funny you should mention him. We have a book coming out, me, Jay Richards, and Doug Axe okay. called The Price of Panic. Okay. The Price of Panic is coming out in October. And I, I have a section in that book uh, where I look at Ferguson's past successes. And your joke is pretty good. I'm going to steal it. He has predicted 10 of the last zero uh, major, you know, fatality <laughs> events. Yeah. He, he's always over predicting. Wow. He, the, the, the bad cow disease. I don't know how many he had, yep. he had dying. The, the, the swine flu. Oh, yeah, I don't goodness. know how many he had dying. And, 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 and it was just ridiculous. SARS, SARS is another one, yep. you know, on and on and on. He's always predicting the worst. And I, I, I like to say that uh, you can't, you can't be fired for being uh, wrong in the right direction. Right. And he yeah. is often wrong in the right directions. He's yep. telling the government what the government wants to hear. The government wants to hear they're needed. They need to be in charge. They need to be in control. They need to restrict people's liberties. They need to increase taxes and yep. increase the burdens on people. That's what the government wants to hear. And that's what Neil Ferguson is telling them time and time again, even though he's wrong, absolutely every mm. single time. That doesn't matter. You can only get fired if you're, uh, if you're right in the wrong direction. You know, you, you can't bring this kind of news to, to government. People still don't want to hear. Right. They don't want to hear that this is a, like I say, this pandemic, which people are freaking out about, do, do people even remember the last one? The swine flu killed yeah. uh, the, the top measurements were around, oh, 575,000 worldwide in 2009. Right. Okay, that's bad and everything, you know, but the flu kills up to 650,000 people every single year. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Every single year. We don't remember that. No. And then back in 67, we had the Hong Kong Kung flu flu that killed about a million people right. more than Corona doom. And mm -hmm. 10 years before that, we had the Asian flu, which killed about 2 million people. We don't remember that. No lockdowns, no government restrictions, no panics, no global uh, freakout that we're having right. now. This is the first time in history that a pandemic has been tracked uh, hourly, even mm -hmm. minute by minute at times. News is coming out. Every new so-called case or positive test uh, yeah. from the beginning of this thing, every new death, every attribution, every possible horror story has been come out one after the other after other. And people have convinced themselves that this is the end of the world, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, may, uh, this is what the time God has willed. Okay. But it doesn't seem like it's going to be by this bug. It's right. just not deadly enough. Well, and it seems like, it seems like if you're in the public health sphere, you need to be wrong in the way that makes the government happy. If you're in sort of the, the medical practice, you have to be wrong in the way that makes the lawyers happy. Like, it seems like, you know, there's a, there's sort of a bifurcation in the health field there. Uh, my, my, uh, my own experience with this was we, we had to see a perinatologist for my first child and he, uh, he had all these measurements on his ultrasound that made it uh, not correct, you know, like a, it was an abnormal ultrasound, right? 
And so I asked this perinatologist who, you know, I don't know, makes six, 700 grand a year or something like that. Right. I was like, okay, so what are my odds? Right. Cause they wanted to do at the time, this was 2011, 2010, they wanted to do an amniocentesis, which could have put the kid in labor, you know, and to, and I didn't want anybody sticking yep. an eight inch long needle in my wife's stomach, you know? And, um, uh, so it, the guy couldn't tell me, and I'm like, you're sitting, you get paid all this money and you can't even tell me like baseline statistics for an abnormal, you know, it feels like that's something you should know. And I find out later that like, basically what it is, is they latch on to a couple of these measurements. And one of them is like, the kid's got a fat neck, you know? And uh, they say this is down syndrome, right? This, this one measurement is some indication of down syndrome. Well, it turns out like, they, they just set their P values and we'll talk about, you know, I want to talk about P values here in a little bit, but they just, they sort of, they make it so that they have the, the right kind of, um, I don't know, my mind's not working right now, but they set their test up so that they have tons and tons and tons of false positives and almost no false negatives. Right. And so then what they yep. end up doing is they tell all these people that their kid has down syndrome and how many of those people kill their kid. Right. Of course. Um, but, and they tell almost, you know, so then, so that they don't make the lawyers mad, right? Because if they get a false negative, well, that's expensive, you know, that, that makes the, the insurance people mad. And uh, I just, that was such a stressful thing for, you know, my wife and I as young new parents, you know, and, uh, and, and it just soured me on all of this stuff, uh, even worse than I already As well was. it should. Yeah. Medicine is terrible this way. Yeah. I, I've been doing medical statistics for over 20 years, right. working with doctors, and I always tell people, after my long experience in working with all these doctors is never get sick. Yeah. <laughs> They're very nice people, but you're, you're quite right. What people don't understand is they have all these protocols now mm -hmm. because of lawsuits, because of uh, bureaucratization of the medic, uh, the field of medicine, all these reasons, everything is run by protocols. Now, well, you got to come in, you got to get these tests. These tests are mm -hmm. way over certain, as you said, they're just way over certain because what, what's important to a doctor, the mistakes that a doctor might make uh, are not necessarily important to the patient. Right. A doctor's loss function, if you want to talk about loss functions, is mm -hmm. not the same as the patient's, but doctors are always bullying patients into following their line of reasoning. And yeah. that's what we've seen in this Corona doom thing too. We've had uh, the Burks and, and Freducci, uh, no, uh, not yeah. Freducci. Fredo, something. Fr Fauci. Fauci, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Fauci. Fauci. Anyway, <laughs> so these guys are up there saying, you know, oh, you may never shake hands again yeah, because right. of course, look, yes. True. You and I shake hands. There's a chance we're going to pass germs between each other. Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of these germs might turn out to get one of us sick. Uh, and, and it's mm -hmm. possible. It's theoretically possible that one of these might kill us. Okay. Yeah. So it's true. Shaking hands might kill you. So we should ban shaking hands. That's a doctor's strategy, but that's insane. That's yeah. absolutely insane. But that's what doctors are like. And all the decisions they make because what counts as good for them, a good outcome for them is not necessarily a good outcome for you. Yeah. This is why you got to make your own medical decisions just as you did. And not rely on these kind of way, way hyped over certain statistics. Right. So the, the doctor can, the doctor can tell you about one thing, but you have to make the decision as to what, you know, you've got other things to consider, you know, and I'm, I'm hesitant to start talking about utility functions, you know, but, it, but that's, that's the kind of general idea is that, you know, doctor, all he, he's just a lab coat. He knows about one thing and that's it, you know? Uh, so what going forward, you know, cause obviously we're probably going to have more of these things in the future. What, what is something that the average person can do as far as like, statistics wise, like besides reading your, your blog, which they should do, but besides that, like, is there something that people can pay attention to, to where they can know ahead of time, like you did, what, you know, um, how bad something's going to be? Is there some kind of indicator, uh, statistically that we get? Yeah. Don't listen to the, the whenever the media starts hyping something, ignore it. <laughs> I mean, how many times were, I, that's the best deleting that they're just propagandists at this. Look, they're all trying to drive clicks. They're yeah. trying to bring traffic back to their sites and things like this, especially since the explosive growth of the internet. Right. I mean, you remember Zika virus. Yeah. That was going to kill us all. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ebola. That was going to yeah. kill us all. Not just once, not just twice, but yeah. thrice Ebola was going to run us over. Yeah, uh, and, and, and the swine flu, the bird flus, the various bird flus, all of these were going to be deadly <laughs> killers. They try each and every time to paint them all as a, as a big, terrible thing. Right. Uh, so you just, the, the only thing you could do is look at history. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I have a table in the, in the new book. I have it on my website, too, of past pandemics, past epidemics, and so forth. These things are extraordinarily routine. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just one of those things we have to live with. For whatever reason God decided we have to live with epidemics, we have them. Yeah, and they're going to come creatures. every yep. 10 to 20 years. Yep. Right. We're going to get them every time. Some years we're going to have very bad flu years. Some years are going to be very light flu years. Right. If you, the 2018 flu year was akin to the coronavirus at first, about the same levels of numbers of people dying or attributed deaths and so on. If we were to follow the, the flu in the press and by governments, the same level of assiduity as we did the, the corona doom, mm-hmm. uh, everybody would be panicked every year about the flu. Right. You, yeah. you just can't. It, yeah. It's not. But it seems like there's, it seems no, like there's I mean, gonna be, it seems like there's some kind of a sea change, though. It seems like now it's like, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned it with the handshaking thing, but it's like now it's I mean, everybody is going to be all over you about whether or not you got your flu shot. You know, they're going to be freaking out at you. And, uh, you know, did you get your flu shot? And if you didn't, then, you know, you're this kind of person and all that, you know, you're a mass killer. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, so here in a minute, I want to I want to get your thoughts on on some more um, some deeper topics about statistics. But one of the main themes of this show is supporting Catholic businesses, and thanks to CabinRugs.com, you can do that while making your living room a more cozy place to be. Cabin rugs are manufactured right here in the U.S., which means they're helping to create jobs here at home and producing a high quality product. Cabin rugs is home to the largest collection of cabin, Native American, and Mesa inspired rugs online. They have rugs, runners, and even large area rugs. Join me in supporting this fantastic Catholic business. Log on to cabinrugs.com to browse their collection today. So uh, I, the, the, the next thing I want to mention is, so you have this book, Uncertainty, and I think everyone should read it. And even though it's a textbook, you know, don't be afraid of it just because it's a textbook uh, kind of thing. But I had been going through your stats class on your blog um, sort of this, this summer. You know, it's one of these things where, you know, classes are out, so I start uh, – I kind of, uh, you know, I have all these uh, great dreams about what I'm going to do over the summer. And then of course, only half of them pan out. But as I was, I was working through that, it just strikes me that the, the logic of statistics that you take is, is totally different from what I learned as a PhD student in uh, even, even, even with my, my, my time series professor was a Bayesian guy. And uh, so I got a good dose of Bayesian stuff. But most of it was classical statistics. And, you know, we did a lot of panel data because, you know, I'm a micro guy. So, um, but your, your view on statistics is so much different. And I think it has a lot of implications, especially for, um, for the social sciences. And, and so, you know, one of the things that has always struck me, because I'm, I'm, I used to be one of these Austrian type guys. Um, one of the things that always struck me is, you know, they talk about how, uh, you know, human events are not these, uh, these, these repeatable, you know, uh, an election or, you know, your, your purchase of a pair of shoes is not the same thing as a coin flip. So there's this property of, you know, human choice that is different from, you know, these statistical events on which we base, you know, probability and statistics like flipping a coin or throwing a fair die or something like that. Do you think there's anything to that or, or what, what would your commentary be on, on that, that general idea? I think there's a, a confusion there as well. Uh, statistics is based on probability. Uh, statistics is just applied probability, if you like. And, and you have to understand the nature of probability. My take on it is different than uh, the classical statistical takes. They believe probability is real, real properties of things. Uh, so if you have a probability of buying a loaf of bread, that probability is in you somehow. All right. Somehow that probability is a real thing, real tangible thing that can be measured about the world or even about dice coming up uh, six or something like this. Mm-hmm. When uh, that's not true. None of that is true. What is, in fact, th- th- the case is probability is a measure of evidence. Probability is purely epistemological. Uh, if we knew, for instance, just on a simple uh, coin flip. If you knew the physics behind the flip, if you know how much initial force you were giving it and how much spin, you could predict every time whether it's going to be heads or tails. There's no probability to it anymore because you know the causes. So uh, it depends on the knowledge that you have, the knowledge that you bring to a problem changes the probability. And the same thing with whether I know you're going to buy a loaf of bread. 
and, and economics. If I know what's causing you to either buy or not buy that loaf of bread, it changes the probability completely different than a guy who's just looking at some bread bought statistics uh, that he got from the <laughs> internet or something. Okay. So the, 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 whole, the whole point is what we're trying to do in science in the old way that we used to do science before it became uh, just another uh, branch of uh, politics was that we were trying to get at the causes of things. We mm -hmm. want to understand the cause of everything. Uh, free will is the hardest part of it because we, we don't even know ourselves what is causing our free will except our own selves. Right. Uh, so getting at that cause seems to be impossible. All right. Whether it is or not, it seems to be impossible. So we can never do really well at modeling human behavior because of that free will, because we don't understand the causes. Therefore, we, we can model human behavior, but uh, it's wholly conditional on all these assumptions that we bring to bear. And those assumptions uh, may or may not hold uh, during the time we're making our predictions. This is why uh, no one trusts economists, nor should they. <laughs> because these things are always changing back in yeah. well back in november would you have said the entire world's economy would have shut down no, over this not. panicked reaction of a virus no you would have had a model and you would have said well last year's gdp was this and this mm -hmm. year's gdp should be this and such yep. because based on these assumptions i've made completely out the window yeah completely out the window so no all probability is there, nothing has a probability. Nobody has a probability, for instance, of being struck by lightning. Right. It, there is no such thing. What, what it is, if you go outside, you go outside in the rain and on, you try to stand in a field during a thunderstorm, stand under a tree. Now we understand there's causes involved. We understand right. there's causes of atmospheric electrification and so forth. And so, so the that's, way, the, that's the way what we kind of mean. Right, right. But the way you say this is that... The, that there is no such, I mean, all probability is conditional, right? And I think that's how you put it, that, that it's just, yes. it's like you yourself do not have some kind of probability sitting inside of you. It's just whenever you do these things that we recognize as, as actual events, then conditional on those things happening, like standing out when it's, you know, standing outside when it's raining and, and, and lightning and stuff, then be conditional on those events happening, there is some, uh, you know, we, we have counted the number of times someone has, you know, been doing those things and gotten struck by lightning. And, and so that's, that's the only thing that, that we mean by probability. It's just a measure of your uncertainty. It's a pure measure of uncertainty and that's it. Right. It's that, that's all it is. It's not an inherent property of any system. It's so then, not a real thing. It's not tangible. You can't go out and measure as you can somebody's uh, blood pressure, for instance. Right. Or, or temperature or something like this. There's no way from any physical system you can extract the probability. It just doesn't exist. Everything is information instead. So, so, I, so before I go on to, because I, I want to I I let you kind of explain the implications of that, um, and especially with respect to p-values and, and stuff like this. But before we get to that, um, so, you know, there's – this idea in some cases that, you know, we have this, we have the soft sciences and hard sciences, or we have, you know, we have the, um, the social sciences and, you know, the, the, uh, the physical sciences, right? So you're saying like, when you're talking about the, the causes, so you're saying like, even, even in, so I, I guess, cause some, some people, and I guess I'm, I'm this, some people, I don't know if there's other people, but to me, I draw this line between the two. It's like, you know, we, we have a, a pretty good idea um, at least at a Newtonian level, you know, about physics and, and, and chemistry to an extent, and maybe biology, we start to say, eh, maybe not, but we're, we're more certain about the causes there. And, and these whole, uh, you know, we, we can do these experiments very easily there. But then I think in, in the social sciences, and I think, um, oh, it was Angus Deaton who, who talked about this when, you know, with his development work. Um, and he's, he's, he's saying, you know, well, you, you can do these experiments, right? Cause you know, the, the thing is these days, right? We, we want to have this, uh, these pseudo random, uh, experiments and all this stuff. And so we, we go to the middle of nowhere, uh, somewhere in Africa and we, you know, we, we have these, we have people do these little, um, <laughs> you know, probability experiments or these risk measuring experiments and stuff. And then, and then we try to sort of build policy based on that. And, and Angus Deaton is, says, okay, yeah, you, you have your, your fancy little, um, you know, uh, uh, random uh, experiment that you've, you know, that you, you're trying to mimic what they do in physics or in chemistry. But the problem is that you don't know if it's generalizable at all because you don't know what other, you, you haven't measured everything. 
there could be other things about that situation that are different somewhere else and you can't generalize to that other. So I guess my thing is like, you know, with physics, I feel like we have a, a better idea of how, to what degree we can generalize from these experiments and, and, and maybe the experiments are good there and maybe they're not so good uh, or not so accurate or useful in the social science side of things. I don't know if I'm making any sense right now, but the, does that, sure. do you, do you, do you, 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 you've nailed it. You, you, in, in, okay. in a simple physical experiment, you want to know, uh, you know, if you raise the voltage this much, uh, mm -hmm. how much will the signal increase? Right. Well, you, you don't have every cause uh, controlled there, but you try to control as many as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely as many as possible. And when you do, or when you can nail the causes, probability disappears. You don't right. need it anymore because you, you know what the causes are. And it's very difficult, even in the physical scientists. I don't know if you remember the cold fusion thing back in the 90s where these guys stuck a couple of uh, plated rods in some water, heavy water, and okay. said, well, they saw excess heat come out of the, uh, out of the thing. And this was going to be uh, caused, they said, by cold fusion mm -hmm. because of the measurement of excess heat. Well, they thought they had controlled for all possible sources of excess heat, but it turns out, no, they didn't. It's very difficult to understand all of the causes that might be affecting even very simple physical experiments. Mm -hmm. What's, what are all the causes affecting people when they make judgments? Right. Nobody knows. Yeah. You can only, you could wave your hand. You could say some things in general, you know, sure. you, we, we know about human nature, uh, which is fixed. And so we could say things, deduce some things based on that, but about individual decision making and, th and, and that kind of thing, there are just so many different things that you can't possibly do it. All you can do is just try to hope that you've got enough of the, of the measures that are causally associated in some way, mm -hmm. uh, tangentially or not, with whatever you're measuring, that you have any hope of a decent model. And in fact, most models stink. What happens yeah. is, and I think you were leading up to this, these social scientists go out and they give an uh, instrument, a bunch of questions that they, that they came up with and they score, they put numbers to, and they say, well, oh, I gave this to some men and I gave this to some women and it turns out men, you know, hate, hate more than women or whatever. <laughs> and I have a p-value here to, oh, to, man, to here certify these results <laughs> as true. Yeah. No, it, no. What, what the p-value is, is no, no, I'm not even going to tell your audience because their, their eyes will glaze yeah. over. Yeah. But it, it, it's supposed to be a measure that guarantees certainty of results, and it does mm -hmm. not. It's right. purely uh, a logical fallacy every time when it's used. Uh, and it, basically, it runs off the idea that probability is real, and this is measuring something of it. Not in a single instance of your experiment. Right. But if your experiment could be rerun an infinite number of times and your experiment was embedded in it, yep. this yep. infinite series of experiments, how many would be more extreme than the one that you got? So that's absolutely yeah. useless to anything that you might want to do. And, that's, and so, uh, sorry, go ahead. It's, yeah. it's real easy to get these things. It's real easy to get these things. Yep. It's just almost trivially easy to get the, a wee p-value mm -hmm. and certify your results as being true and applicable to all mankind for all time and all circumstances and all situations under every possible condition. That's what they're basically claiming. And it's right. nuts. And yeah. so in, in, in psychology and sociology, uh, they're having, and even in economics, they're having what they're calling replication crises. Yep because people had these famous papers that came out and showed all these things that seemed absolutely against intuition and common sense, but they had to be true because they were science. Yeah. And then they started to redo these things and uh, <laughs> just to see if they were going to pan out again. And they're finding yeah. lo and behold, they're not yeah. because they were, they were using all these crappy statistical methods, assuming probability is real and all this kind of things and, and, and using P values and all these other ideas, their mm -hmm. over certainty was massive and, and they still can't understand why they right. think it's something wrong with the people, the setup, but they yeah. don't understand. It's the, it's the way they're analyzing this stuff in the first place. And, and so I say, look, statistics should be treated no different than uh, civil engineering. If a civil engineer says, look, I got a theory, I'm going to build a new kind of bridge. Mm -hmm. All right. Using these new kind of supports and he builds the bridge. If the bridge falls down, we know the theory was false. Right. Right. Yep. If the bridge stays up, we know the theory must have been okay or possibly yeah. okay. 
All right. Why not treat all these models and everything that uh, sociologists are coming up with, the educationists are coming up with, psychologists are coming. We should treat models they use and create exactly the same way. Test them against reality. Yeah. Can they not just say I saw something in the past and then create a theory out of that and say it must be true, but test it again. See if it works. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, it's not real. And by works, you mean like, can it, can it predict? I mean, if we're only talking about, you know, sort of gathering data and, you know, can it, can it predict, uh, you know, going forward? Like, and, and you mentioned in your free stats class thing here, like, you know, it, can it, can it predict, can you predict, can you build a model to predict you and, and, and predict data that you haven't seen yet, that you haven't messed with yet? Absolutely. And data you have not seen in any way or right. used in any way. Right, right. It has to be new data. Because it's too easy to fool yourself with old. You could fit a model. I don't know if your listeners know. You could fit, anybody could fit a model. You'd take any set of observations on anything, mm-hmm. any phenomena you like, and I could fit a model that fits that that set of data perfectly. Yeah. Anybody can. Right. And it doesn't mean that it's going to work then in the future. Right. The only way to know is to use that model to make predictions of data that nobody has ever seen. Just like the civil engineer making his bridge. Right. And right. it just shocks me. It doesn't work that way. What they do is they go out and take a set of measurements. They fit their model to this set of measurements in the past, and they certify it by wee p-values, and then they say the theory yeah. is true. Never test it. Never test it. Yeah. And I think, I think part of that is like, you know, we're, when, when we're taught this stuff, you know, we're taught it in the context of, you know, giving policy advice. And, and I, I remember um, – I remember one of my professors telling me about this. He was, he was at a meeting for um, some kind of marketing order board. So like in California, you know, they, they decide how much of their almonds or whatever they're going to destroy or, or throw in the ocean or whatever to keep the prices up. Right. And he was brought in to measure the elasticity so that they could come up with, you know, how much, you know, what percentage that I need to pull off the market so that we could get, you know, a certain percentage increase in the price, right? That's elasticity. Oh. You know, and we're so, we're so, uh, you know, our whole um, perspective on economics is built around these, um, you know, these, uh, uh, these derivatives, right? The derivative of this, this model, right? These partial derivative of, you know, yep. uh, Y with respect to X, right? And so it's, because we're trained that way, we're not, I mean, in some cases they are, you know, the the macro guys, I I had a professor who's like, his whole work was all just like predicting gasoline prices and stuff. So, I mean, there is a prediction element, but I think a lot of us are trained to look at those, uh, you know, those betas and just figure out, you know, well, what's a partial derivative? Aha, there's, you know, this is a policy relevant number, you know, um, and, and the mm-hmm. p-value, it's like, you know, we just, we just like the p-value because that, that lets us get through the, uh, the publishing process, right? So, I mean, it really is like a, it's the system in, in a lot of ways that it is perpetuating all of this. It removes from you all responsibility of thinking. Yeah, and I, and I love that about your, your perspective in here because you, basically your response to that is like, look, you know, you as, like, there, there has to be some practical thing going on here, right? Like, there's a reason why I'm building this model and I have to decide whether or not, you know, when I include this new variable, well, is that new variable going to give me information that's useful to me? Like, can I make a decision based on that variable or not? Um, or, or, you know, can I, can I obtain uh, reasonable measures of that variable? And if not, I'm just going to deal with the fact that I can't, uh, you know, it's just uncertainty. I can't deal with it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But of course, you know, people want to have, uh, they want to have math to blame. They want to lean on right. something to say, this is why I did what I did. But, but it would totally change and, papers. And, and, and you don't want to take personal responsibility. Of course it would, sure. it, it, it yeah. would, it would slow up and, 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 mm-hmm. and because look, if you come up with a theory, any, any type of theory that you like, and uh, it, it took you a, a year to painstakingly collect all this data. And now you've got your theory, you've got your model in hand. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, so you got to keep your mouth shut. Now you got to wait another year, mm-hmm. make a yeah. prediction based on that model publicly. Right. Before, you know, before anybody, <laughs> because it's, listen, scientists, uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, how much your listeners know this, but scientists are just like everybody else. They lie, cheat, steal, manipulate. <laughs> the, 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 the easiest 
person they fool is themselves. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> every, you know, we have a thing called confirmation bias. You know, everybody, every scientist is taught about confirmation bias. People go in looking for things and they find them there. And even if they're not there because they're so desperate to see them. Every scientist believes in confirmation bias, but none of them believes it happens to them. It's always yeah. the other guy. <laughs> yeah. and, right. and so you have to make these, you have to put out your results in a way that is public. I can test. I don't have to know what you did. I don't have to know all the intricacies. You just said, if X happens, then Y is, uh, has a 10% chance of happening. Now I can just see if X happens and if Y is going to happen or not. And I can collect my own statistics on that and see if your model works. I don't have to know anything about your model, the, the theory behind it. I don't have to know anything about the theory behind bridge building to drive over a bridge and see if I crash or not. <laughs> so that's the way we have to treat all models in a public way. I, if you're claiming this is science, you put it out there. Here it is. Here's the prediction. And then wait and see. And then we can critique models in that way. That yeah. would, you're right. It would absolutely change publishing. Oh, yeah, I mean, hey, we'll just take everything and, and shake it upside down. I mean, this is supposed there to be, be a lot of broken of, hearts. I mean, yeah, right. I mean, this is supposed to be the job of the journals. They're supposed to be gatekeeping this appropriately, you know, and, and, and of course, the, the, no, the whole system. No, no, you, you, you know, <laughs> well, I know journals exist now to, to get money. Yeah, uh, it's a, yeah. it's a huge, huge business. They sell these yeah. subscriptions to libraries and uh, yep. make the journals copyrighted. So you, nobody can go in and read yeah, these things right. without paying and, 30, and $40 <laughs> to read an article. And they get all the editing and, and all of that and all the submissions for, for free or very little, <laughs> you know, and, and in, in a lot of cases we pay them. <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. That's all exactly true. So it's I, a scam. I, 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 it, yeah. That's a harsh word, but I think it's fair. Oh, it is. It is. Yeah, it's <laughs> Especially totally yeah. what's going on in science these days. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, so I, the last thing I wanted to mention and, and get your view on was uh, the polls, you know, and so we, we got all of this, uh, you know, we had, we had the issue back in 2016 with uh, this idea that, you know, people didn't want to answer the, uh, the, the theory is at least that they didn't want to, they didn't want to answer the questions accurately. So like they didn't want to tell the pollster that they were going to vote for Trump because uh, you know, it's a social desirability bias, right? They didn't want to look bad to their friends or they didn't want to look bad to this MSNBC pollster uh, calling them up. Um, do you think that's accurate? And, and if it is, do you think that that's still happening today or, or should we believe the polls? It, it certainly must today? have been accurate. It, it, yeah, it must mm -hmm. have been accurate right. because the, all the polls had Trump way behind, even up to the last minute. Only I, I called it publicly that Trump was gonna win. Mm -hmm. long before the election right. based on my own models. All right. But very few people, Rasmussen was kind of close. The, mm -hmm. the problem with it is, is the, the honest ones, the honest ones, what they have to do is they, they're not just trying to make a guess of uh, who's going to win. They're trying to make a guess of who's going to show up to the polls and vote. And they try to, okay, so you're thinking it's going to be, uh, oh, I don't know, 55% Democrats and 45% Republicans. And so that's what they try to go out and sample, right? So all of these things, they, they always build in the assumption that more Democrats and Republicans are gonna show up. And sometimes they do that on purpose. Sometimes right. they have these things, uh, they're more or less push polls. They just way right. over sample Democrats and say, here's a sample of voters. And, uh, and, and here's the, because they're trying, to, they're trying to push the direction of the thing in the, in, in the way they want it to go. So you have to be very careful reading these polls to see what it was comprised of. Yeah. It's much better to look, uh, it's much better to look online and look at, at what, uh, what people are actually doing. How many are showing up to Biden rallies versus Trump rallies in the same, you know, uh, battleground States, that kind of thing. Those would be much more of a, a better indicator for you. But by looking at the past polls, which were all heavily in favor of, uh, of, of Clinton last time, Right. We're, blew it bad, big time. Yeah, right. Didn't even come close. So there, there is a shy voter thing. How much it's there, it's, uh, nobody really knows. But uh, right. I know if you were just accosted on the street in a big city, somebody's, you know, you can't, you can't even go down the streets in some of these cities and wear a MAGA hat anymore without yeah. getting attacked. So why are people going to tell you the truth? Right. And, and it's just uh, not as likely. And I, I think some people try to defend the, the previous polls by saying, okay, well, you know, they were, they were pretty accurate on, you know, the, 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 the popular vote, but they, they got the, um, 
you know, they got the electoral college wrong. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I mean, if you, if you, if you get the actual race wrong, then, you know, I mean, it's not like they only ask about the popular vote. They ask all this other stuff and they have all these state, you know, the yeah, state level polls. So it's not really an excuse in my mind. They're obfuscating. They're absolutely obfuscating. They, 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 no one, no one cares about the popular vote. Everybody yeah. cares about the electoral college vote. That's what the polls ostensibly were about. Right. And, uh, and they blew it. Right. So you, so you think it's, it's potentially at least a, a, a similar, uh, a similar case this time. Oh, and, and you, everybody knows how partisan all the networks are. Sure. Uh, yeah. So there's just no use looking at anything they put out. It's all going to be uh, shaded one way or the other for whatever reason. But there, you, but gotta, you don't, there's you don't no, think the, the, the polls themselves, the, the, why, why look at the polls anyway? I mean, unless you're trying to make money on this. They have right. prediction yeah. markets. You can look at prediction markets. These are people who are putting their money, uh, real money. So you're, you're betting, you can't do it in the United States, but they're online. Uh, right. So you, you're putting real money, you're wagering whether or not Trump is going to win. Uh, so these people have skin in the game. These are more likely to be somewhat yeah. closer to the mark uh, but I, but than, I, but than I, polls, which are nothing. So my thing, my thing about the polls or, or about the betting markets I, or the prediction markets, I, you know, I, I, I see that perspective, but I also think, I mean, I almost wonder how much, how much more accurate they can possibly be because I mean, you still have this like sort of poisoning effect of the the polls and really, I mean, the prediction yep. markets now are, I mean, they're last I checked and it's been a while, but last I checked, they were just as much in favor of uh, Biden, uh, you know, winning. As, so, some uh, of them have Trump ahead now. Some okay, of them have Trump okay. ahead now, but, okay. but you're right. Listen, I, and it just occurred to me, I never thought about it before, so I'll credit you for this, but uh, <laughs> how much would it cost you to make a few bets for Biden if you were the DNC you know, yeah. you you blow sure. three or four thousand dollars on betting for Biden on this. So what? It's a campaign. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a push poll. It's a push and poll. Boost through that. Poll and it's another way of putting. Yeah, exactly. I mm-hmm. I don't. I, I can't, I'm not saying that's happening to anybody. Right. right. I'm saying it's, I've never thought of it till now. But yeah. it could. Why not? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I can't imagine what they pay, you know, to do the polling, especially their own internal polling. I mean, you know, that, that costs money. And, and I mean, you know, these, these news networks that do the polling, they, they're always doing them with this other group like YouGov or, you know, that's supposed to be independent. And I guess that's supposed to give you a veneer of, of credibility on it. You're like, Oh, it's not just in this NBC. It's also YouGov and they're very respectable and all of this. And it's like, yeah, but I mean, mm-hmm. are they, are they, any, I mean, they're just the same urbanites, you know, <laughs> with the same opinions, you know? Uh, so, so, exactly. so the last thing I wanted to mention, and I think I've already said that twice now, but the, the last thing it was on this P value stuff and you, you have a piece um, on September 9th on your blog. Uh, who do you trust more a Sturgis biker or an academic economist waving his P value around? <laughs> so I love that, but it, but it makes me think of these polls. And so if you could just explain real briefly to my audience, like whenever they see a poll and the poll says, you know, uh, uh, you know, 53% uh, approval. And then, you know, with plus or minus uh, 4%, right? What, what is it? What should they take away from that? Like, does that, does your perspective on p-values and the problems with p-values that you've explained so far, does that, does that factor in whenever we see a poll like that? And we've got this, we've got this sampling margin or whatever. Yeah, that, uh, that plus or minus they give you is a theoretical number based on all these things we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it doesn't mean a pre- it's not a prediction. It's not a predictive plus or minus. Right. That's just based on the theory of how many numbers that you were able to collect and everything and absolutely indifferent to the, the result of the poll itself. The rule of thumb that I've discovered is to uh, uh, about double it. <laughs> so if they say plus or minus four, make it plus or minus eight right. for a prediction. Right. No, I, that's that's about yeah. right, uh, and and I then see. you'll get a much better prediction. Of course, there's much more uncertainty then, mm-hmm. but people don't they abhor uncertainty, and so they right. try to find measures that confirm what they want to know. Yeah, they, they want to the call. Mistake. They want to call that's a thousand people on the phone and tell you that because fifty two percent of those people said X Y Z, that fifty two percent of the public says that, but then they 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 realize exactly. that nobody really buys that, so they got to put this. Uh, you know, sort of statistically generated number on there, but then like you're saying, you know, and, and I'm, I've, I've seen the same thing, you know, it's, you see a, you know, a, um, an actual, uh, you know, margin of margin of error and predictions, you know, and, and get into that, those kind of statistics that always, you know, the world seems a little bit more gray than <laughs> it does when, you know, whatever, always. whatever your canned program spits out for a P value and all that. So, <laughs> so, 
Well, hey, you know, I really appreciate your time and, and I hope everybody checks out your blog if they haven't already and uh, pick up that book. I mean, I have, I, have a, I have a very young audience, but a lot of them are very interested in these kinds of things. And so I'm, I'm really uh, confident that they will be interested in um, probably going, running, running through your stats class and some of them might beat me through it. But um, yeah, the price of panic that we have coming out, that's a general audience book. Oh, yeah. Anybody yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So is there a pre-order for that yet or? There is on Amazon and elsewhere. Okay, okay, great. Well, I will I will make sure I link to those so that they can get a hold of that as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, hey, thanks for your time again. Have a good one. You too.